to Contra Costa County Library's second round of Let's Talk About It Muslim Journeys reading and discussion series. Um, last round we focused on the connect connected histories of Islam and the West. Um, and in the second round we were going to focus on the theme American Stories, uh, biographies about or by American Muslims. Tonight we're going to focus on the book Prince Among Slaves by Terry Alford about Prince Abid Al Rahman and his enslavement in Mississippi in the 18th to 19th century. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Library Association uh, for awarding Walnut Creek Library this grant that allows our community to be one out of 125 in the nation to participate in this series. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Walnut Creek Library Foundation for supplying coffee for us tonight and for making high quality programs like this one possible. Um, you can visit their website at wclibrary.org. Um, you can check out upcoming events there and you can also learn about um, what makes the foundation possible and what they do to make things possible here. Um, this series is also supported by the Northern California Islamic Council, Zaytuna College, the San Ramon Valley Islamic Center, and the Center for Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union. Now, these events are all going to start with a 30-minute lecture um, by our scholar, followed by about 45 minutes of small group discussion. At the end of that, we'll have a little bit of a 15-minute question and answer period. Um, before, you, before I introduce you to our scholar, there are a couple of guidelines I'm going to touch on. Uh, first, this series is not meant to spark a debate among us. <laughs> this series is meant to start a dialogue, and a dialogue requires a safe space for exchanging ideas. Um, please respect those of us tonight who have the courage to speak, as well as those who'd like to listen, and those who'd like to do both. Right? Um, yeah, just basically help foster a safe space so that everyone feels comfortable expressing their thoughts. And number two, um, a goal of this series is to develop a deeper and more informed public understanding of Muslims and their cultures. If anyone is here tonight to convince others that any religious followers are fundamentally bad people, or that any religion is a fundamentally bad religion, we ask that you please kindly consider convening your own discussion at another time in an appropriate venue. Now, this is not a curtailment of free speech, but rather a legitimate policy for maintaining the integrity and civility of any discussion series. So, thank you. Now, uh, leading all five events in this series is our scholar, Dr. Hatem Bazian. Dr. Bazian is a co-founder, member of the Board of Trustees, and faculty member at Zaytuna College. Um, at the University of California, Berkeley, he is a senior lecturer in the department's of Near Eastern and Ethnic Studies. Dr. Bosnian teaches courses on Islamic law and society, Islam in America, deconstructing Islamophobia and othering of Islam, religious studies, and Middle Eastern studies. Uh, Dr. Bosnian received his PhD in philosophy and Islamic studies from University of California, Berkeley. And his current research is focused on Contra Costa County and the growing Muslim communities in the Bay Area. For more on his research, you can um, actually Google um, his recently published, quote, Bay Area Muslim Study. There's a lot of um, groundbreaking research and statistics that came up in that study. I recommend everybody take a look at it. Um, and it's available in its entirety online. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hatem Bazian. Good afternoon and uh, good evening. And welcome back for all those who were with us in the last series. 
uh, hopefully this series uh, will bring us home because this last series we were traveling all over the world uh, from India to China to Persia to Yemen, Cairo, uh, North Africa to Spain, Italy, Rome. So the last series delves very well into this series uh, where we begin to discuss the history of Muslims in America uh, but contextualized with American history. Uh, to give just a little bit of briefing about the American Muslim community, uh, the statistics about how many Muslims there are in this country is still subject to tremendous uh, debate and discussion among the scholars. Uh, the Pew Research put the number at two and a half uh, million uh, adult Muslims in 2010 and if you extrapolate two and a half million adults with an average family of ten, no two and a half uh, average family so you come up with a figure of close to five maybe five and a half million uh, so the number of Muslims tend to be a range because as you know on the census uh, we don't have a category for religion and as such, much of the uh, studies are based on an educated uh, guess estimate uh, using a variety of data. The Pew did a random uh, sampling in order to reach, to reach the number two and a half million. Uh, but it is a community that is increasing and expanding. In the five county Bay Area, uh, we have approximately 250,000 uh, Muslims living in the five uh, Bay Area County with the largest number of Muslims living in Santa Clara uh, and then the second largest will be in Alameda uh, followed by uh, San Francisco, Contra Costa and then Marin County. Uh, one of the largest single uh, populations in the Bay Area, Muslim population, is the Afghan population. And for uh, possibly those who are in Concord, Walnut Creek, Hayward, Fremont, Newark, uh, that uh, territory has a large concentration of Afghans who began, who began to arrive here in this country uh, post the Russian invasion of 1979 and continue to arrive searching for uh, safety, security, as well as opportunities in this country as the U.S. granted the Afghan population a refugee status. Uh, most recently, the largest number of arrivals, uh, Muslim arrivals, are uh, Iraqis, uh, Palestinians, and increasingly Syrians, uh, who are being uh, uh, given or granted uh, entry into the United States based on the circumstances. Uh, Iraq is in particular as we ended our deployment and involvement in Iraq, uh, which seems is never ending considering that we're uh, engaged once again. Uh, the U.S. took uh, with it from Iraq a large number of Iraqis who were part of the civilian contractors, translators, infrastructure of those who supported and worked with the U.S. and uh, as such this presented or provided a larger number of Muslims arriving uh, into, uh, into the United States and that continues uh, to be the case uh, of at least from 2010 uh, onward. Uh, my projection is that we will be getting a, a, an influx of a large Afghan population in the next year or two, or two uh, as the U.S. ends its involvement in Afghanistan, uh, there will be a, uh, a number of Afghans that will leave with the U.S. Uh, to possibly get repatriated and given uh, residency and refugee status uh, as the U.S. ends its involvement in Afghanistan. And this has been the norm. Uh, for the U.S. and I often compare it to the Vietnamese community. Uh, prior to 1975, there wasn't any uh, really critical mass of Vietnamese in the U.S. There were a limited number of Vietnamese, but as the U.S. ended its involvement in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, 
uh, the result of it, there was a massive influx of Vietnamese who came with the U.S., but also as destruction was visited upon Vietnam in post-U.S. Uh, uh, departure, uh, opened the door for immigration, a large immigration from Vietnam to the United States, settling in many parts uh, of the country. And one of the unique places is San Jose, where you had a high concentration of Vietnamese, so much so that you have actually two Vietnamese council members that uh, won their election and ended up actually opposing one another on the naming of a particular section of the Little Saigon inside San Jose. So not only that you have the global political uh, picture impacting the local, and here our understanding of the local and the global has to be constantly shifting to understand that the, lo the global is local and the local is global simultaneously. Now this book, Bring, uh, Prince Among Slaves, uh, by Terry Alford, is an important uh, work um, that comes at a critical juncture of beginning to examine in a closer way uh, the identity, the religious identity of uh, slaves that were brought uh, to the Americas uh, post the discovery. And one of these is Prince Abdul Rahman. In studying the work of Terry Alfred, actually there are two books that have to go simultaneously with this book. Uh, one of the books is by Alan Austin. Uh, and Alan Austin, likewise, is a historian uh, who uh, actually was one of the early individuals to write and document biographies of Muslim slaves uh, in antebellum America. He actually put one of the first source books on the subject. Uh, his book was about, or his source book was about 800 pages, and therefore it was not easy to sell. So he actually redacted into a very short book uh, that, was, uh, that was put in the market and actually had some success. Uh, Alan Austin documents the biography, the biographies of 67 Muslim slaves uh, who were identified during the early period of uh, America's history of being Muslim that maintained their identity as Muslim while in captivity and under in this institution of slavery. And some have actually developed communities, in particular uh, an individual by the name of uh, Saleh Bilali uh, in the Sapolo Islands in uh, North Virginia, where he actually, in his, uh, it, he led a community that was completely uh, functioning as a, a Muslim community throughout the period. So Alan Austin's work is also connected uh, to this work and can be read almost as a comparable reference uh, text with uh, Alfred. Another book that is also important and can be seen also connected to this work is Sylviana Diouf. Uh, Sylviana Diouf's book, uh, which is titled Servants of Allah, uh, African Muslims Enslaved in the Americas. Uh, Sylviana Diouf uh, is an African American, uh, uh, an African American researcher of uh, Senegalese origin, not, not Muslim herself, but a brilliant scholar. Uh, who actually wanted to see and document uh, the number of Muslims that were uh, brought into the institution of slavery uh, during the period of uh, slave institution. And she came with the figure that a low of 10% and a possibility of high of 20% of all the slaves that were brought to North America were of Muslim background. So in essence, what she documents is that there were a considerable number of uh, these Muslim slaves uh, that were uh, brought early on. And as such, she wants to establish from a very systematic research, uh, looking at all available sources at her disposal, uh, of the presence of Muslims in the early development of America. Uh, now, most of these works, interestingly enough, were written pre-9-11, because you also confront this notion that did this work emerge as a result of 9-11 to make Muslims appear to be patriotic Americans, uh, 
by presenting a genealogy that locates him at some earlier place, as close to Columbus uh, <laughs> history as possible. Uh, and we always try to reference, anytime we speak about Columbus, we all need to understand that Columbus was, was lost on his way to India, right? <laughs> He wanted, he really wanted to have some chicken tikka masala with naan. <laughs> and as he arrived on the shore, he ordered that. And they told him, no, no, no we only have cornbread. <laughs> and that's when he realized that he was lost. And the Native Americans realized that. And basically began to give him some direction of how to get back home. Uh, so once again, these works actually predate 9-11. They had nothing to do with attempting to locate Islamic history or Muslim history in America in a more reactionary way post 9-11. And as many Muslims who face some of the prejudices post 9-11, uh, some of them wanted to carry the largest flag as a way to say that we are Americans. But all these words have nothing to do with this. Actually, this was a historical research of trying to close a gap in the treatment and in uh, the writing about America's history. Uh, the gap has been present not only for Muslims, but also for many other communities. We still have a tremendous gap for Native Americans and how Native Americans history is treated. Uh, we still have a gap in how Chinese American history is treated. We still have a gap, up, gap about Mexicans and Latinos in our society. And as we see the consequences in Ferguson, uh, we still have not dealt with African American history and how we could still uh, need to do much more, not only to deal with the history, but the meaning of the multiple histories uh, that we confront on a daily basis. So this work is to close a very important gap in the history of America by narrating and presenting the Muslim narrative in the complex narrative that is America. America is a mosaic of narratives that is complex, that is entangled, it's not all uh, orderly and nice. There are definitely ugly chapters in our history that we have to confront. There are definitely high points in our history that we need to celebrate and as such this has to be seen as an attempt to try to direct our lens to an area that has not been uh, understood before. Now, in thinking about uh, Abdul Rahman Ibrahima, or Ibrahimo as possibly been uh, articulated, now both Abdul Rahman is a compounded name, it's, one of, it's a common name in Arabic, Abd meaning slave uh, or servant. But it is not to be understood in relations to the institution of slave. It's actually the servant of the merciful. So it's a common, uh, it's a common tr uh, practice in the Islamic tradition and the Arabic tradition to use a compounded name with the first being abd, servant, and then the second being one of the 99 names of God. So for example, Abdul Rahman, uh, Abdullah, which many of us often referred to as Abdu, right? So Abdullah is the servant of Allah, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahim, Abdul Malik, the servant of the uh, possessor of the world, right? So this compounded name is a common uh, practice throughout. The second is Ibrahim, which is a, uh, the rendition of Ibrahim, the prophet Abraham. Right, so that is the uh, part of uh, his name. Now he's, uh, in 1788, uh, the kingdom of Futojolon. Now in here, when we think about West Africa, Islam began to arrive into West Africa at such an early stage. Uh, the Muslim arrivals in North Africa gets almost completed by the early 8th century. Uh, crossing into Spain by 711, and I often say the reason that uh, possibly many Muslims own 711 is reminds them of that. <laughs> but for those who oppose it now, you're going to have a whole boycott of 711 because there's some connection to the conquest of Spain. That's not the case, right? But in general, 
Muslims arrival in North Africa and crossing into Spain at that time, uh, the arrival of Islam into Sub-Saharan Africa is actually takes place not militarily but by mostly by two means. One by trade, uh, as trade develops in uh, parts of uh, West Africa, uh, the result of contact with uh, the arriving Muslims uh, as trade caravans so on influences the conversion to Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa. The second uh, part is actually through marriage with connected to this is also Sufi tradition or Sufi practices. In essence marriage connected to Sufi practices was another avenue for conversion to Islam. In both cases trade and marriage and connected to Sufi tradition was seen that individuals or communities were marrying into an ascending power. Just to give you a comparison, for a long period of time, people in many parts of the world wanted to marry Americans, right? Because the assumption is that, you know, marrying America, you're moving into the first world rate, and you needed to get a green card, but that's a second issue, right? So the assumption is that the Amer America was an ascending power, and as such, marrying or marriage relations or even trade relations with an American indicate that you have access, uh, you have developed certain uh, ways to improve your standing in your locale, and as such, similar circumstances and similar conditions were operable relative to Muslims in, uh, in Africa. At the same time, when we think about the arrival of Islam, this developed into local political arrangements developing in West Africa. So it was not a matter of Muslims that came from external, external uh, presence into West Africa, rather the local tribal leadership converted but maintained its control and its running of the society. So in essence, it was not an intrusive uh, uh, approach in Sub-Saharan Africa. This similar to the North Africa where military campaign was a very rapid and decisive and the military campaign resulted in a complete transformation in a rather short period of time. Sylviana Diouf mentions in her book about slavery institution in West Africa and this is important for us because when we often discuss the subject of slavery, we often get the retorting back, well the Africans had slavery. And as such, that argument is made in essence to dispense with the particular nature of the slave institution that it de developed in the New World. All slavery are essentially a st a structures of inhuman practices. But even within that, there are differences that are very profound. And therefore, we do find slavery in West Africa. We do find Africans enslaving other Africans. We do find Arabs enslaving Africans. We do find Africans enslaving Arabs. Slavery was practiced, but it was not in the same pernicious structure of slavery that developed in uh, the New World. And what we find is that the slave institution that developed facilitated an increase in the structure of regional conflicts in West Africa. One part of it is that as demands for slaves in the New World increase, regional conflicts increase, and therefore guns for slaves was one way to accelerate and expand these conflicts because the more conflict occurring, the more slaves or prisoners of war taken from each side, and those slaves, those prisoners of war were sold into slavery in exchange for guns that could be used to protect oneself against the competing power and many of the slave traders actually were selling weapons to all parties, uh, thus also depressing the price for slaves by creating a structure where uh, uh, expanding and accelerating these uh, regional conflicts. Abdul Rahman actually gets caught in the middle of a conflict where he was a leader of uh, a part of his father's army and he gets caught uh, in this uh, process and then he is walked into the coast, sold into slavery uh, to take the middle passage 
uh, and then arrive into Natchez, Mississippi to be sold into slavery. What I'm pointing in here is that as we study slave institutions, we have to make a relationship between the visited destruction in West Africa that continue to be with us today and the institution that came and developed in our own new world. Those relationships have not yet uh, dissipated. Actually, they're still with us uh, up to this uh, point of view, uh, up, up to this current period. Now, in speaking about slavery in the new world, why was slavery needed? Why did we need slaves? Uh, one, uh, the Native Americans were uh, subject to a genocide. And therefore, the indigenous population uh, that were, would have been present uh, to possibly assist in maybe rebuilding or building a society was completely put to, to uh, a genocide. Uh, and what we have is a settler colonial project that succeeded uh, in eliminating uh, this population. And also the Native Americans were essentially not amenable uh, to be a, uh, taken as a labor force uh, into their own land. Uh, the type of industrialization, the type of plantation, uh, agricultural economy that was needed was not something that the Native Americans were used to, nor if they were used to would be accepting in this sense. As such, as the economy of plantation and the land expansion took place there, we needed a labor force. And the labor force essentially uh, uh, was understood and accepted to be the importation of slaves. And this importation of slaves actually was connected uh, to a particular development of race theory. Uh, as we are, once again, uh, race is still with us today. It's like it's one of those unspoken words, right? Even in the White House, you don't speak race. And we still have not discussed and debated race in, in, in essence. There was religious rationalization for race theory, uh, the curse of Ham, uh, Genesis uh, uh, chapter 9, verse, uh, uh, verse 25, and so on. There's a, this religious rationalization and justification that actually emerges in Europe uh, between Northern European and Southern European. Northern European are pure blood, did not mix with Jews and Muslims versus Southern Europeans, and as such, not only that you have a particular identification and crystallization of critical race theory connected to religious texts, but also you get scientific, uh, pseudo-scientific, I think to call it scientific would be an insult to science, but pseudo-scientific argumentation about the uh, uh, classification of, ra uh, 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 of races, of human races, and I would remind you uh, that uh, Darwin had actually in his classification, he had a classification of races. Uh, it's one of those words that we don't celebrate as much as celebrate the nice species, right, the monkeys and so on, but he actually had a racial hierarchy as well. And a particular time there was a whole pseudoscience, and in so much so, in a certain point in time, in European history, you actually had human zoos, where you actually go and visit the various types of human species in different part of evolution. In France, in Belgium, right, there actually were these human zoos that were articulating a particular race uh, theory uh, as such. That argument essentially makes its way as one of the justification for the enslavement and bringing of African slaves into it because they were not deemed to be humans. Right? And as such, not deemed to be human makes you a commodity, and as such, you could be bought and sold. Now, Abdurrahman has taken 3,000 miles journey uh, into the Middle Passage, arrives in Natchez, Mississippi, uh, and sold to Thomas Foster. Uh, he initially runs away, right, because uh, uh, his experience of the slave conditions and what, what he finds himself under is completely uh, shocking. But at the same time, also he's coming from a military background, military training, he's uh, educated as well, which later on I will speak about. He's actually educated in uh, university in Timbuktu, uh, one of the foremost uh, 
uh, academic institutions in West Africa. Uh, just most recently, there's been a whole disaster of loss of large number of manuscripts in there. Uh, but Henry Gates Jr. actually visited when he did his documentary about Africa. He said that he saw thousands of manuscripts and he felt like a little child in a candy store but can't taste any because he doesn't know the Arabic language nor the local uh, dialects where these manuscripts are uh, written, uh, written by. So he was sold to uh, Thomas Foster. He runs away, but in an immediate period, he recognized that he's in a different, in a circumstances that he can't uh, really change and alter, and decides to come back and puts himself into uh, the accepts the slave institutions that he has been sold uh, to, and he begins to work in the cotton production uh, uh, in Foster's farm. Uh, and in here, the connection between the particular type of agricultural products and the particular slaves, uh, many slaves in particular from West Africa were favored in North America because of some of the skills they had in particular type of agriculture. Cotton was one of those, uh, one of those uh, products. Uh, he actually uh, was married. Uh, uh, in the slave institution and Foster looked or viewed marriage as a stability and uh, that's not the norm actually that's the exception uh, in slavery uh, many slave many slaves in the US uh, during their uh, captivity they were not allowed to marry they had uh, sexual relations but often also the slave master had much uh, or considerable sexual relations and if anyone have read Malcolm X as it relates to Malcolm X's mother, uh, her light skin feature she uh, speaks about that it was a result of the slave master who have raped her mother uh, at an early stage and that's why you have the lighter skin features and there are also a debate that develops in Malcolm X's own house between the lighter skin children versus the darker skin and Malcolm X because of his lighter feature tend to actually be a little bit more favored uh, in the family versus those with darker skin. So you have also these racial racial attitudes, not only from outside, but racial attitude that actually develops uh, internally. Uh, in his marriage, uh, he had five sons and uh, four daughters. Uh, and as he gains his freedom, he attempts to try to uh, purchase the freedom of uh, his, uh, his children. Now, in 1807, Mr. John Cox, uh, who is a doctor uh, in a ship, uh, who gets sick and actually uh, is rescued by uh, Abdul Rahman's father in Futo Jolan, and actually he stays with them for a long period until he's nursed into health, and then Abdul Rahman actually takes him to the coast uh, for him to uh, ride the ship again and go back uh, to Ireland. So. Cox, after a long period of time of not actually meeting or seeing uh, 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 Abdul Rahman, runs into Abdul Rahman in the market, and Abdul Rahman recognized him because he had a patch on uh, his eye, and he says, "I know this man," and sends his son to see if his name is actually Mr. Cox, so he remembers him, and sure enough, Mr. Cox remember him, and they embrace right there. Uh, in the in the market now you could see the shock of individuals who actually used to stay away from Af from African Americans or African slaves as far as you can get here's a white person uh, with all the trapping of uh, status and prestige at the time actually embracing a slave right there in the middle of the market uh, Mr. Cox actually for nine years attempts to uh, purchase uh, Abdul Rahman's uh, freedom from Foster uh, and uh, essentially fails to do so not because of lack of want but Foster actually refuses uh, to sell his uh, most valuable uh, uh, most valuable slave. Cox dies in 1816 and then uh, Dr. Top Cox's own son took the task to free Abdul Rahman from slavery. Now Foster refused because Abdul Rahman became so valuable because he was the slave, uh, the slave driver, he was the head of uh, the whole uh, plantation. Now it's important here to step out is that some number of Muslims 
as well as those who were in leadership position other than Muslims in uh, West Africa, as they were brought into the slave institution, they actually arose in the slave institution to head and to be the slave drivers and the overseer of other slaves. And this skill, we could see it in Abdul Rahman, not only he was able to read and write in Arabic, but also had military training and had education that made it possible for him to essentially be, become indispensable uh, for Foster, whose uh, wealth uh, became tremendous in a short period of time, uh, owning about 1,700 acres. Uh, and uh, it's essentially uh, Abdul Rahman overseeing this with 40 slaves, including Abdul Rahman's own family. So if you take, he had uh, five sons and four daughters and their kids, literally between 25 to 30 percent of the slave uh, membership of Foster's slave institution belonged to Abdul Rahman. So, Abdul, so Foster was essentially still looking from an investment possibility and what would be the freeing of uh, Abdul Rahman would mean to him. In addition, why's, res why's resistance to freeing slaves? This is, the, once again, the South. Uh, freeing the slaves was not the norm. There was a uh, movement to free the slaves in the North, but in the South was one, one of the most contested issues. And as such, Foster did not want to be part of, this, uh, of the encouragement uh, that is taking place. Uh, larger political tensions in the country medicated against uh, the possibility of uh, freeing him. And then the fact that Abdul Rahman was educated and knowledgeable possibly trumped any type of uh, argument relative to pseudoscience that, the, that these individuals relative to the Africans are incapable of knowledge, incapable of education. If anything, Abdul Rahman proved otherwise. And so much so that he was far more educated than many of the slave owners that were around him considering the type of training that he has received. Now, Abdul Rahman's journey to freedom begins after his own daughter, uh, Susie Ashley, is raped by one of uh, Thomas's foster's sons. So that becomes, for him, is a major crisis. Uh, uh, foster's son is married, and now he sees that uh, he could bear himself being in a state of slavery, but now he's seeing that his daughter uh, is being attacked and that Foster might not be living long and as such, what would be of his children, and in particular, uh, seeing what uh, the possibility hold for the future. So he writes the first letter after that incident. So it was a crisis, uh, in particular relative to his own daughter, uh, that begins the journey uh, toward freedom. Andrew Marshall from Mississippi's first printer helped Abdul Rahman draft a letter. So the letter is drafted and sent to Henry Clay, Secretary of State, who receives the letter and uh, thinks that the, the letter that was written uh, is actually from a, a, a Moroccan, a Moor. And therefore, in here, the recognition of someone being of a Moroccan is removes the individual from the category of African. So categorization in here is very important. A Moroccan is seen to be of a higher level of civilization Right? Because here you have, still have the Ottoman state, a uh, very well established civilization. Morocco also gave recognition to the United States. So the category of Moroccan, of Moroccan means civilized. The category of African is uncivilized. And therefore, by putting the person as a category of Moroccan, you could actually maintain the pseudo-scientific racial categorization intact uh, without having to confront internal arguments. Uh, so as such, they forward his letter to the U.S. Consulate in Morocco, and the Sultan of Morocco reads the letter and asks the president, asks President Adams and Secretary of State Henry Henry Clay to, re, to release Abdul Rahman, uh, Abdul Rahman, to the Prince of Futo Jolan. So in essence, they, the Moroccans know that he is not of Moroccan, but that did not stop them in intervening, right, in uh, his status because for them. Their world of view is shared by religious identity, not a racial identity. For them, Abdul Rahman is a person of, uh, of Muslim background, and if he is seeking their intervention based on that identity, then they should use their best offices to try to win his freedom. 
Uh, so in this sense, you could see that the Moroccan response was within their world of view, and also uh, President Adams was acting with his, with his own world of view, meaning trying to maintain the racial categorization intact, even though at the time they didn't know the difference between a Moroccan uh, uh, and somebody from Futo Jolan, and I think they still don't know that even today, <laughs> for the most part. Uh, 1827, Abdul Rahman was freed on the condition that he was never to stay and live in the U.S. as a free man. Uh, that was the condition that uh, uh, Foster put upon him. Uh, also, Abdul Rahman was able to, uh, to, buy, to buy his wife's freedom and went to Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, slavery was already outlawed in the state. It's interesting that in Ohio, it's one of the early mosques uh, in America's history, is actually you find it in Ohio, so there's a long historical links of African Americans who actually built some of the early mosques uh, in America. Uh, he continued to work to raise funds to free his children, and he went actually on a speaking tour, uh, visiting many of the uh, cities, uh, to raise funds and to get donations met with some of the key uh, uh, abolitionist leadership in this country and was celebrated in many different parts of the country where the anti-slavery movement was taking hold. So in this sense, he was successful in one part uh, in trying to raise funds and in doing so he did manage to have enough, to raise enough funds to free two of his uh, sons and their family uh, that also went back with him. John Quincy Adams refused to help after discovering that Abdul Rahman is not from Morocco. Uh, so once again, once he discovered that he is actually not of Moroccan background and that he is uh, African, he did not uh, offer his help. Plus, he was also getting ready for an election campaign and he did not want to be seen as one that is essentially putting or hitching his wagon to uh, uh, the free slave movement or the abolitionist movement and uh, in essence you could see the debate taking place around the country many articles were written about Abdul Rahman as he toured and also attacks from the south directed at uh, uh, John Adams especially as the election intensified so Abdul Rahman played prominently uh, in that uh, in the election uh, the Afri the, he visited with the American Colonization Society now the American Colonization Society wanted or undertook the, the campaign to free slaves but from a very, very particular racist interest. Uh, they wanted to convert the African Muslim slaves to Christianity, so that was one of the uh, uh, ideas or notions, to help free slaves and send them back to Africa, believing that Africans are not suited to remain in the U.S. and will not be equal. So basically, they were acting from a racial, completely still well-developed well racial attitude. Not, it's not based on inequality or that this is a condition of injustice. It's just saying it's much better to free these slaves and send them back to Africa and not, uh, uh, not wanting to be here. Also, in help, this will help possibly in civilizing Africa and open markets for America's trade and products. Uh, so this was not... Uh, based on any, you know, uh, high ethical moral values, but rather a utilitarian understanding, a utilitarian approach uh, to the slave institutions. Now, Andrew Jackson's election uh, basically clo closed the door for uh, Abdul Rahman staying in this country, uh, because as Andrew Jackson won his election, uh, he knew that uh, his days and his uh, period in America would come to an end, the difficulties would be rising, and he decided uh, to finish his uh, campaign for collecting funds to free his family. The anti-slavery anti rhetoric focused on Abdul Rahman, and he has considerable writing on this, uh, and he was not much successful in raising further funds for his family, freed only two sons and their families. Uh, also, Foster responding to this intensified debate uh, revoked uh, Abdul Rahman's freedom and wanted to call him back to his uh, uh, to be captured and returned back to him. So he claimed him as a property. Uh, March 18, 1829, he arri arrived in Monroe, Liberia, uh, and also followed by his two freed sons and their families. Uh, died six months after, and also Foster died in the same year. Uh, those relatives of his or his sons and daughters that joined 
him in Liberia. There still their descendants are present in, in Liberia. And also around New Orleans and also in Mississippi, there's a large descendants of Abdul Rahman that are there. And 2006, both branches of the family actually gathered, uh, making a gathering. And there was a documentary uh, by the same name, Prince Among Slaves, where the end of the documentary actually shows the gathering of both parts of the family coming and essentially uh, making links that were disconnected by uh, the time that uh, Abdul Rahman died. More so, there's an annual festival that centers on Prince Abdul Rahman and his descendants uh, in New Orleans. So the celebration and continued uh, renewal of Abdul Rahman's legacy uh, is still with us today, and I think this is an opportunity for us to once again think of history as not part of the past. Uh, history is not history as long as you are still entangled with it, and therefore the history is with us, and we just need to find new and creative ways to contend, to deal, to uh, contextualize our relationship with it, and through it, possibly you could make new vessels for a better and more, uh, as I would say, hospitable future for all of us. We're all in the same boat, uh, regardless of which compartment you think you are. <laughs> so we'll come to the same boat, and hopefully we'll have a fruitful discussion. What we do is usually we have groups of maybe five or six in each of the table. There's questions that uh, have been prepared to stimulate the discussion. Uh, if you did not read the book, uh, we understand uh, it's, uh, it's a, what you call, it's an intention to read, but hopefully you'll have a conversation. Some of the ideas that you heard in the lecture can stimulate some discussions. And what we want is somebody to maybe take some notes and give us a report back about what each table came up with. And myself and Jeff will uh, go around and possibly share some ideas and listen. And then we'll come back for a 15 minutes uh, question and answer at the end. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you.